make certain that's circulated around the auditorium. So please welcome Justin. today. Um, my STEM talk is going to be on the science of paper restoration, as Dr. Kofess had mentioned. Um, we will be focusing on the science of restoring and conserving works of art, um, documents, maps, um, newspapers, any, any ephemera on paper, quite frankly. We, we see collectible cards, we see um, lampshades, everything on paper you can imagine. Um, I'm, I am president and owner of ACA Paper Restoration. Our studio is located in Devon, Pennsylvania. Uh, we provide uh, services and consultation uh, with regards to the restoration and conservation on all the items that I just mentioned. Um, just to give you a little background about myself, uh, people often ask me, how did how'd you get into this business? It's a little bit obscure. Um, I, uh, I started, I had a marketing degree. The reason they ask is I, I got out of college with a marketing degree. I went into pharmaceutics. Um, I was uh, managing um, document management and document archiving departments and quality assurance groups for a couple large pharma companies in my career. Um, as much as I enjoyed the uh, organizational aspect of that kind of work and creating efficiencies um, and developing archiving solutions in those positions, uh, at the end of the day, it wasn't the type of work that really inspired me. So uh, I wanted to uh, get myself into something that I look forward to going into every day. I was able to use that experience and um, uh, also through what tra translated into basically an art minor in college, because I did take a lot of peripheral art courses. I was able to get my foot in the door in uh, this industry and transition into it. Um, I've been working in this business for over 15 years, about 16 years now. Uh, the last 10 is owner um, and executive director and president of ACA Paper Restoration. Um, what I love about this business is how interesting and inspiring it is for me. As I mentioned, I wanted to be inspired by the work I did, and this certainly does that for me. Um, besides the ability to just see very beautiful and interesting items that come across uh, my desk or my table or in our studio every day, um, it's uh, the access to the stuff that's especially amazing to me. Um, just to be able to hold in my hand a letter that was written by a, a famous historical figure, uh, hold an original piece of art by a, a well-known fine artist. Uh, for me, that connection is just particularly special with, uh, with what I do. I love going to museums and, and looking at the art, but there's, there's something about touching something that uh, kind of makes that connection even more strong. Um, the type of work also inspires me to learn, um, whether it's art I'm learning about, or if it's history, pop culture, uh, even technical information, the, the things that come through our studio always inspire me to, to either learn more about what it is, learn more about who did it, uh, or some other tangent that it inspires me to go off on and, and learn more about. Um, there's always something to be learned every day, um, and you never know what's going to inspire you to investigate further. It's all fun, um, it's fresh, and it's diverse. So let's move on to our presentation here, the science of paper restoration. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to break this down into basically three sections. Um, if we're going to talk about um, the restoration process and the science of restoration, we need to talk about the damage itself and what we're remediating. So we're going to start off with reviewing the causes of damage to works on paper. Um, then we'll go into treatments and remediation, which is really the crux of the science of paper restoration. Uh, and uh, we'll be coming close to the end of our time, but I'm going to just quickly go over preventative methods. So. Um, Maybe you don't have to worry about the science of paper restoration. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about the causes of damage, and um, I've listed seven here. Uh, the most common things you're going to see. It's the most common issues we see in our studio. It's likely the most common issues you've all seen out there in the world, um, and it's also items that can actually be restored. You can't fix everything, but these certainly can be remedied to some degree. Uh, we've got P acidic pH is the most common issue we come across. Um, UV light exposure can harm paper, that's sunlight. Uh, you want to keep your paper, works of paper out of sunlight or protected from the UV rays. Liquid exposure, we've all seen wet paper, um, how that affects it. Mold and mildew, um, bug infestation, bugs love paper. Um, 
materials exposure, by that I mean um, varnishes, uh, adhesives used with framing or tapes, basically um, extra materials that the substrate's being exposed to. Um, and then mechanical damage, uh, we're basically talking about um, stresses on paper and damage due to improper handling. So there's obviously many more ways paper can be damaged, but as I mentioned, this is, uh, these are the most common ones and ones we're gonna be discussing. The most common issue that we and every paper conservator in the world um, has to deal with is acidic pH. Um, and acidic pH is natural to paper, um, especially that made of wood pulp. Um, this causes paper to discolor. It can turn yellow, turn tan, um, or turn a dark brown, any, any um, variants of those kind of hues. Also can dry out a substrate and um, cause it to become brittle, which can obviously cause cracks and such. Here's some examples of acid burn here. Um, uh, what we have on the top left here is a real mild case. It's probably what you're gonna see out there most often. It's very mildly toned. If you compare it to the stark white here on the title, you can see it's, it's just slightly burned, a little bit of the warming of it. In the middle, you got the more yellow tone. Um, when uh, work on paper that is acidic and going through the acid burn process is exposed to UV light, it's sitting in the sunlight, you're gonna see um, it present in that more yellow uh, hue than the browns. And then in the bottom right there, you have one that's severely acid burned. Um, this happens when you have uh, highly acidic environment that is dark and there's no light reaching it. So if uh, work on paper that's been in the dark and acidic for a very long time, a good number of years, can end up looking like this. We're talking decades, though. It takes a long time for that to happen. So why does this paper turn brown? Let's get into some science here. Um, part of the components of wood um, trees and other plants is lignin. Uh, lignin, I uh, put up the Wikipedia definition here for you. Um, but this substance is basically a polymer or a binder for the cellulose in wood that kind of binds all that cellulose together to make wood hard and rigid and it gives it its strength. That, that's the nutshell definition of what it is. But this is the stuff in the paper that's actually turning brown. The way it works, is um, when lignin molecules are exposed to just, just the general pollutants in the air, uh, such as sulfur dioxide or nitrogen oxides, uh, they begin to have their structure altered. And uh, through this oxidation process, the, the lignin becomes a chromophore. Um, chromophores are the molecules that are responsible for color um, that we see in things. It's basically, um, they're, the molecules exist on and everything that you look at that reflects light. So whenever you see a color in something, or identify any colors in the chairs, the table, the walls. Those are chromophores that reflect specific um, bands of uh, light on the label. Uh, in the case of paper, this presents as yellow, tan, or brown hues. So those chromophores are reflecting those colors. Um, sunlight can also cause and expedite the acid burn process. Um, it's basically just another oxidizing reactant that's involved. So you have the, uh, the lignin and the exposure to the uh, atmosphere and then the lignin exposed to the sunlight or the UV rays will also oxidize it and cause it to turn brown. Another factor in expediting this process is contact with other acidic materials. So if you have acidic mats or acidic backings in a frame that you have or you're storing it in a, in a cardboard fold or cardboard's acidic, that's why it's so brown, um, that can actually expedite the process as well. What you see here is a watercolor. Um, Presumably, you'd say this is a freshly painted watercolor here, um, and then just existing in a regular everyday environment, it's going to get exposed to the atmosphere and sunlight, and eventually becomes brown, like you see on the right. Now, an example of the sunlight expediting the process, and I'm not sure if you can see that on the screen there, but the very top band on that painting is a bit lighter than the rest of the acid burn. This was a matted painting, so that mat covered the uh, image and protected it from the UV rays, basically. It was still acidic, so it did burn and turn brown. But as you can see, the image itself, where exposed to the sunlight, darkened more so than that uh, area that was covered. Another blemish you often see with works on paper is called foxing, and that's the brown spotting you see on paper. Um, this is often associated with uh, acidic pH in paper, but it's not necessarily the case. 
Um, it presents as the same hues as acid burns. Um, it's you know, figured it's the same kind of process. Uh, however, there's a number of causes that um, factor into foxing. This, the process isn't 100% understood, but um, fungal growth can cause it, um, as well as particulates resident in the substrate, such as um, thicker piece of wood pulp, um, or even uh, small metal particulates that are oxidizing it and staining the paper. All right, uh, the UV light exposure um, obviously can um, expedite that acid burn, as we've mentioned, but it can also fade out pigment. Um, you're looking at a Japanese woodblock print here. On the side here, the left side, you have a quite a brilliant colorful image um, that's been exposed to sunlight over an extended period of time and what you end up with was si the significant fading of the pigments. Typically you're going to have your warmer hues be affected by UV rays. Your reds, your yellows, your oranges, they're going to fade out uh, more significantly than your cooler <laughs> hues. In this case it's quite quite significant exposure and it even affected the blues and purples. So you had the, the, um, light, the cooler hues affected as well. Um, it looked like really the green was the only color that survived in, in that uh, exposure. Liquid exposure can cause a number of issues with works on paper. Um, rippling is the most common thing you're going to see with it. Even just a little humidity in the air can cause the work on paper to ripple. Um, rippling is due to paper displacement. Paper absorbs moisture, it wants to absorb moisture, and it absorbs it a bit inconsistently. Um, this inconsistent absorption causes the paper fibers to relax inconsistently. When you, get it, when you hydrate a paper fiber, it is going to relax a bit. So if you have different um, absorption rates in different areas of the paper, you're going to see that rippling to start to occur. When it gets real bad is when it dries um, improperly, if it's not pressed while it's drying, um, you can experience even more rippling because the, uh, the contracture of the areas is going to be consistent as well. You see on the left here um, a print that was significantly rippled. You don't see a lot of staining or anything on there. It's just some rippling throughout the entire substrate. And the fact that it's through the whole thing lends, lends us to believe that this was probably just in an extremely um, humid environment causing that rippling. Um, liquid could also cause staining. Um, if it's water, it's not necessarily the water that's staining it. If it's clean, but it's really the, the particulates or dirt or other chemicals in the water or if it's just another liquid altogether it's got pigment or, or color it can, it can stain a uh, work on paper. On the right you have some staining here you see in this newspaper caused some tide lines which is the darker line at the edge of a, of a liquid stain. In the case of this dolly drawing in the middle here um, you can see that the paper was quite dirty and the right side was exposed and left a lot of dirt and particulates and just made the, the drawing look quite grungy. Another issue with liquid exposure is you're going to leave your paper much more susceptible to mold growth. Um, liquid uh, water is what's going to um, start the molds from growing. So you want to watch out for that with liquid exposure. You might need to do mold treatment as well. Um, here's a print that has several of the issues that um, I've already discussed here. We have the acid burn with the general browning of the print. Um, it has adhesive staining around the edges here. You see that lighter band around the image. Again, that's how um, uh, UV light exposure would present. Uh, the image is a little darker, but it, this did have a mat on it. That's why it has adhesive, but the covering would cause that area to be lighter. In this case, it's actually a little bit of a gray background in the image, so that's not what caused it, but just so you can see what that effect is when you have uh, the UV light protection and how much faster it'll burn. Got the liquid staining at the bottom, a little bit of a faded pigment. I'll show you an after of this one uh, later on in the presentation so you can see how we address that. As I mentioned with the liquid damage, uh, mold growth is a problem with paper, especially when it gets uh, humidified. Um, mold and mildew can grow in a paper substrate as a result of, result of high humidity um, or even complete hydration and liquid exposure. Mold spores exist everywhere. They're in the atmosphere. They're on the floor, they're on our furniture, they're on the items that are on our furniture, they're in our cars. Mold is everywhere. Um, all it takes is a little moisture um, and a food source to get it to start growing and to be able to propagate and spread. What we have here in this image is a paper substrate and uh, the substrate 
itself is the nutrient for the mold. And just a little bit of humidity, a little hydration on that very outer layer of the substrate was enough to get that mold to start growing. The fact that the paper itself is food enables it to start growing through the substrate and um, can grow quite quickly and cause significant damage if not um, remediated. Um, the cellulose and starches in the paper are the food source that's uh, attractive to the mold. Um, and again, even just a thin, thin moisture layer can really start that process. It's something to be careful with. Here's some examples of mold growth. Um, it can present superficially uh, as well as grow into the substrate and cause staining. Uh, what we have here on the left is a pastel painting that we restored. This had significant superficial mold growth. So I put this after picture just so you can see how much it actually affected the pigments and how heavy it was on top of the pigments. It actually looks brown instead of the blues and the greens and such. Um, different situation on this pencil drawing on the right. This experienced significant staining from uh, mold growth. The mold growth grew, grew through the substrate. Um, and this is a case where mold, uh, mold can stain in all different colors. Um, this one has multiple colors. Um, not sure if it presents well on the screen there, but you've got pinks, greens, blues, reds, browns, and blacks um, staining this drawing as a result of mold infestation. You also have some deterioration of the paper here in the top of the head, you can see. <laughs> Bugs <laughs> eat paper substrates. This causes textural damage, it causes pigment loss, and it causes paper loss. Um, what we have here is a black and white print that was significantly infested by bugs. Um, in this case, it was silverfish, which is this guy you see above the roach. Um, silverfish, uh, you see them in bathrooms and basements. They like um, cool, wet, uh, dark environments, and they really like paper. We, there's, no, there's no bug we see uh, damage from more often than that. Uh, so what it did here, it ate almost the entire margin. Um, it ate in it indiscriminately through the image, through the paper, it ate pigment paper and everything. This is a significantly affected um, print because of this, this bug infestation. Um, again, the starches and cellulose that are resident in the paper substrate are a good food source for the bugs and that's what they're attracted to. Other issues with bug infestation um, is with the staining and deterioration that be caused by um, droppings that are left by the bugs, um, egg cases, cocoons, um, body shells from when they molt, um, and even um, dead carcasses. Um, various beetles and spiders are also found. Um, they're not always interested in eating the paper. Sometimes you'll have a bug infestation because they're actually more interested in the frame that your work on paper might be, and they'll either eat the frame or they might want to, want to use it as a, as a habitat. Roaches like to eat paper too. That's why that guy's there. Um, foreign materials such as adhesives and finishes, another thing that can damage paper, um, particularly with regards to staining. Um, they can also cause a substrate to become brittle and crack. Um, tapes used for mounting purposes can also cause tears. Uh, paper skinning, which is when you peel the tape up, it just takes that top layer of, um, of paper or pigment up with it. And it can also cause rippling. For instance, if you have uh, I work on paper taped down on the edges sporadically to keep it mounted to a backing. Um, the paper's gonna have to breathe in the environment as the humidity changes and the temperature changes. Paper fibers are gonna stretch and contract. Um, and if you have areas that are taped down that can't move and flow with the paper, that's gonna cause rippling in the paper. What we have here is um, a mat that was heavily varnished. I put the after picture of that one just so again, so you can see the example of how heavily varnished that is. You can see a shine from it. You can, this actually caused cracking through this one. Um, you can see some of those lines going through there. Uh, this print in the middle is a Louis Icard print, and that is varnished as well. We don't see artwork varnished as often as maps. Um, this particular artist does like to varnish some of his prints, and so she's supposed to have a white dress on. So that's a that's a very significant staining effect that varnish has. And then another staining effect is adhesive. You have this Picasso print here on the right. Um, heavily glued in the margin in order to adhere a mat to it. Um, as you can see, that's significantly stained. And when it's this heavy, it, you can actually have it stained right through the substrate. And it, it's typically it'd be on the back with staining for backings, but it can come through and affect the image itself. And moving 
continue on to the mechanical damage, again, this is just stresses from improper handling and such. Um, this can cause paper to tear, cause it to curl, it can cause it to crease. Um, all these blemishes are unsightly. And people like to have those remediated. In the case here, we've got a watercolor on the left that was torn into 16 bits. We call these spike pieces when they're obviously uh, done on purpose. We see marriage certs every now and then in this state. Um, but that was uh, obviously mechanical stress tore it up. It was a purposeful, but it is what it is. And the one on the right is just an antique document. As you can see, it's tightly rolled. When you roll paper and store it in a tube or something, um, and it sits there for years and years, it's going to get brittle because it's acidic. It's going to want to stay in that curled state. You're going to take it out, and it's going to be so brittle, you open up, it just literally falls apart. That's what happened to this person's document. Um, so, you know, without anyone even doing much to it, just sitting there in that rolled state and going through the process of aging caused it to tear and crack and have all those issues. So that covers the damage that we commonly see. Uh, let's move on to the treatments and remediation, which is really the crux of what we're talking about here with the science of paper restoration. I'm going to break this down into three sections. We've got chemical treatments. We'll discuss a little more in depth on the science of it there with the chemicals. Um, Application, uh, there's different ways to apply these treatments, um, some more appropriate than others in different situations. And then finally manual treatments, we're basically talking about tools and muscle here, uh, where chemistry isn't necessarily appropriate or could be harmful for the work on paper. So we're back to pH neutralization. This is the main, this is the main thing with uh, paper conservation and restoration. Um, Neutralizing a pH is done chemically uh, with the introduction of a pH neutralizing agent. Uh, in our studio, we use a, a magnesium oxide solution. Uh, what that does is um, it not only neutralizes the pH, but it also leaves an alkaline buffer in the substrate, meaning we're going to put that pH a little beyond, a little higher than 7. We're not going to perfectly neutralize it. We're going to put it a little bit on the alkaline side. And the reason for that is, as I said, Paper is going to become acidic naturally just by existing in the air. The natural pollutants, or the pollutants that are naturally in our air, are going to affect it. So by putting that alkaline buffer uh, in the substrate, it neutralizes that natural uh, acidification effect. Another large part of paper restoration is stain removal. Um, stains can be removed with a number of chemicals. Some are more commonly used ones. Some of the more commonly used ones we've listed here. Um, sodium hypochlorite is an aggressive manner of cleaning. It's basically your house, your average household bleach. Um, this is what we actually prefer to use in our studio. It is the most aggressive, but it is also the most effective. Um, it has, uh, you know, some some folks might say that that's a that's a real dangerous way to go about um, treating a work on paper. It's actually true. Um, when it comes to bleach, you can actually harm the substrate, so there's um, subsequent treatments that are necessary to ensure that your substrate is healthy as it ages after this treatment. Uh, chloramine tea is a less aggressive treatment. It takes a little longer to work. Um, it, it works, but it doesn't work quite as effectively as um, the sodium hypochlorite. Same with hydrogen peroxide, a very mild um, cleaning treatment. It can slightly oxidize uh, staining out. Um, you can get some mild brightening from hydrogen peroxide. Um, we don't find it very effective, so it's not something that we use, but uh, it has been used in the past and is used currently in some organizations. Alkaline water isn't technically a stain cleaning treatment, but we use that uh, in a situation where you might have superficial residue on, um, on a work on paper uh, that hasn't necessarily stained badly, or if you have dirt or ground in dirt in a situation where you need to float it out of there. Um, we'll use an alkaline water bath to diminish that kind of effect on the work on paper. Here we have a print that underwent a sodium hypochlorite treatment. As you can see, it was heavily acid burned. We've got some significant water staining throughout. And uh, so we put that in a bath. And as you can see, everything cleaned out very well. It looks, on, it looks almost new. It's uh, got a little bit of the tide lines. It's hard to see. but. Um, that's about the results that you can expect from the oxidizing process um, that's applied to paper. So how does it work? Um, three steps. We have cleaning. Uh, you want to get that, that staining oxidized and cleaned out of there. The second step would be rinsing. 
Uh, it's very important to rinse any anything out of there uh, that you use to clean it. Um, cleaning agents can actually be detrimental, as I mentioned with the bleach. Uh, it can be detrimental to substrate, so you really need to make sure you rinse that out. Uh, and then finally, resizing, which we'll uh, get into in a little bit more detail, but that's basically replenishing the paper with um, st stabilizing materials that are washed out in the cleaning process. As I've mentioned, with the bleach, you need to do some subsequent treatments to make sure the substrate's healthy going forward. Um, we're most commonly washing works on paper in order to clean out the appearance of acid burn. Um, this again, cleaning the acid burn again involves um, the lignin molecules in the substrate and altering them. Um, exposing the uh, lignin molecules to an oxidizing solution causes them, again, to change um, in a manner that alters how light uh, is reflected off of it. So the, um, th this process will make these brown and yellow hues that it's currently reflecting no longer be reflected. Um, it breaks down bonds in the molecule um, and it gives the um, substrate a brighter, whiter appearance because it's not actually reflecting hues anymore. Uh, the rinsing aspect, you have to thoroughly rinse it out, as I said. You can, you can cause some issues of deterioration of paper, but another issue is um, mixing chemicals. You have to be real careful that you don't do one treatment, not completely remove that chemical, and then give it a treatment with another chemical. You can cause damage to the, to the work on paper. More importantly, you can cause damage to yourself. It's, it's not healthy, necessarily. For instance, uh, some things we need to clean, like varnishes, we need to use ammonia to clean that. It's the only thing that's going to break that down and get it off the substrate. You don't want ammonium bleach together because you're going to get some noxious fumes. Um, so you have to really make sure um, that you're going to rinse out all of that ammonia before you expose that to the subsequent cleaning, so the, uh, cleaning treatment uh, that might have some bleach in it. Um, let's see. We have um, this resizing aspect. I want to show you an example. Um, as I said, we have to replenish um, the paper with uh, with things that are washed out during the uh, cleaning process, and specifically, we're talking about sizing. Um, what sizing is? It's, it's originally done to paper substrates, uh, paper pulp during the manufacturing process. Um, and what this sizing does does is it serves as a filler or a glaze for the paper. Um, I always find it best to show an example of this. So here we go. We have our common printer paper here, all right, and then we have a paper towel. This has been sized. Um, you have a nice, smooth paper. It's rigid. Um, it's actually not very absorbent compared to other papers. It'll absorb, obviously, but you drip, a, you drip some water on there, and it's actually going to sit on there for a minute before it soaks in. Also, the important thing is it's holding that pigment. That pigment's put on there, and it's, and it's staying there. It's not bleeding out. It's not bleeding through. It's holding that pigment in there. Paper towel, just the opposite. It's flimsy, you can't get it to stand up. It's rough. There's little gaps through the fibers. You can see light coming through. So there's no filler, there's no binding. It's easily torn. Um, and it soaks up uh, materials, liquids, and such much faster than a sized uh, piece of paper. If we took a Sharpie on this, it'd bleed right through, and it would bleed right out. If you took a Sharpie on this, you'd have a nice straight line. Unless you really went over it, it wouldn't bleed. So again, resizing, uh, that's sizing, we resize it, so we're washing that sizing out to some degree. We're resizing it, uh, it involves a replenishment of the cellulose um, in the paper substrate, uh, increasing the stability and suppleness of the substrate. Um, cell sizing is done with starches, um, cellulose, and polymers. In our studio, uh, we use a animal gelatin solution to uh, do our sizing. It's kind of like giving your work on paper a, a post-workout smoothie to punish it. Uh, adhesive and varnish removal. Um, adhesives need to be softened uh, in order to remove them um, out of a substrate. Um, this is done with water or mineral spirits. We prefer water. Um, it's easier for us. It's uh, benign. Um, and in case it, it does break down with water, we can actually put it in a cleaning bath. The water breaks down the adhesive. We can take the mats and backings off and then do the cleaning all in one bath. And that doesn't work. We use mineral spirits. Um, that breaks it down. Um, it, it, evaporates quickly so you don't get saturation and bleeding of the adhesive in there. Um, what we have here 
and oh, I'm sorry, we have also varnishes uh, which are removed with ammonia, as I'd mentioned before, and that's done with a bath. So we have, an, we have a varnished print here. Um, as you can see in the previous pictures we showed of varnish, it's significantly yellowed. You can see that shine that's caused by it. So we did the varnish removal with a subsequent cleaning treatment on this in order to uh, make George and his crew there uh, look like they're in a winter scene instead of a desert scene. <laughs> Um, heat is also helpful with uh, softening um, adhesives, so we actually use what we call a heat pen sometimes to remove um, adhesives where it's the tip's flat like a blade and it gets heated um, and that's able to slowly soften it so we can peel things up as we go along without tearing the paper as it comes up. You don't want to heat a large amount of, of glue on, on a paper substrate because it can actually bleed into the paper more, so you want to keep it localized and do it quickly. Uh, here's our birds again. Here's the rafter of the birds, and just to show you what this cleaning process did, we, we took care of the liquid stains, we cleaned out the adhesive staining, we cleaned out the acid burn. Uh, we did go back and actually pump up some of these colors, just ever so slight, because they were a little bit dulled from the um, damage that the, that the birds had incurred. Uh, mold treatment. Mold spores have to be killed in the substrate in order to ensure uh, future mold growth doesn't occur. Um, the use of fungicides such as thymol um, and sodium hypochlorite accomplish this. Um, thymol is a naturally occurring antimicrobial and antifungal agent. Uh, we use that for um, uh, documents, watercolors, basically any work on paper that has fugitive pigments that would be affected uh, if exposed to liquid. Um, sodium hypochlorite, again, bleach, that's used on more stable works on paper. Uh, for instance, a black and white etching or a pencil drawing where you really don't have any worries of the pigment leaving the paper uh, based on the liquid exposure. Uh, from a business perspective, for us, this is a best case scenario because we can do the cleaning and kill the mold with one, um, one bath there, one fell swoop. We have our pastel here again. As you can see, it was heavily mold infested superficially. We removed that mold and then applied a subsequent time mold treatment to this to take care of it. Um, another thing you might hear out there as far as mold treatments freezing, um, people say, yeah, it's, you get liquid and you see mold growth, chuck it in the freezer and that'll take care of it. That'll stop the mold growth. It's not going to make the spores start growing. Um, however, when you pull it out and it thaws again, it's just going to be as susceptible to mold growth as it was before you put it. So that's just really buying you time. It's not an effective remedy. Light exposure and bugs, uh, again, we talked about these guys. The damage that's caused here is, is really they're just taking things away from the substrate. They're taking pigment and they're taking paper. Uh, there aren't any chemical treatments that we can fix that with. You can't, you can't take uh, like that black and white print we showed with the bug infestation. You can't just take that, stick it in a bath and pull it out and oh, all the paper's back and all the pigment's back. You have to just manually put that all back in there. So we have our, our retouch artists come in here and pump up colors with, with uh, pigment. Um, in the case of bug infestation, it's not, it's not a local issue with your work on paper. It's an environmental issue with the building you have your work in, so you need to get yourself an exterminator that will help take care of the bugs in your paper substrates. So as I mentioned, the UV light can fade out pigments. In this case, this is our Japanese woodblock print that we were looking at earlier. So uh, when something's faded like this, you're basically just uh, painting in the colors again. Um, the pigments that we typically use are either watercolor, colored pencil, or pastel. They all work quite effectively. Um, occasionally we use acrylic, acrylic pigment because uh, we do clean a lot of pop art, a lot of screen prints, the Warhols and uh, Lichtensteins of the world. Um, but more often it's these three items that we're using. Here's our bug infested print again. We mounted that to a piece of archival paper to reestablish that nice margin. Did a little filling in the image to smooth out uh, the paper and pigment loss in there and then touched in the pigment back into there to make that look like a nice pretty print again. So again, we're just putting back what the bugs and the light took in these situations. Mechanical damage again, we're talking about stresses, creases, tears and such. Um, this is remedied through repairs and pressing. Uh, tears are mended with archival paper and archival uh, adhesives. We typically try to use wheat paste. Um, we do some methyl cellulose glue on occasion. Um, sometimes we need to make our own tape uh, with a product called Lascout, which is that's the adhesive that we put on strips of paper to, to make archival tape. 
creases and other textural blemishes are flattened in a press. Uh, I have some examples of our pressing techniques here. Up here you have, these are called book presses. This is actually a custom made press for our studio. It's a, book presses tend to be smaller for obvious reasons, so we had a real big one made um, to accommodate works on paper that are larger. Um, we also do manual pressing with weight. You have a couple of pieces of particle board there. That's heavy stuff. And in conjunction with what we have underneath, which is felt. Felt is an outstanding way to press things, especially in our case when we have an enormous work on paper, like a wall map or something that's not going to fit in our typical press. We can use um, this felt to actually press it out. So it's a, it's a mechanical pressing. It just takes time. Um, it doesn't work as well as our heat press, which is what we have over here. This is our preferred method. It's a heat and vacuum press. You can put a work on paper in there while it's still humidified, um, which, as I mentioned before, keeps the paper fibers relaxed. So when you have it humidified and in that heat press, the heat's going to dry it out. It's going to be flat, and that's the best way to really flatten a work on paper. When you do it manually, it always wants to kind of go back into the shape that it was in before. So if it was rippled, it'll be diminished, but you have to keep doing it over and over because you'll, you'll take it out, it looks flat, and it sits out on the table for a couple days, and you'll see it want to get those, those ripples coming back in again. Severe creases or textural damage, sometimes we can mitigate with a little help of uh, with alcohol and some hand burnishing. Alcohol does a very nice job of relaxing fibers. It evaporates quickly, so it doesn't cause any staining in the substrate. Um, so occasionally we'll do a little local burnishing with the burnishing tool, basically a little hook look, looking tool that you rub on the back of the substrate to flatten it out a bit. These items had mechanical damage, as we saw before. You have our watercolor there. We put it all back together, and then we retouched all those tear seams so it doesn't look like it's got a white line checkerboard through it. And then you got your document over there. We had to humidify that to relax it a bit so we could actually open it up without having it fall apart. And then we patched that all back together. This was likely mounted to a backing as well to ensure it, uh, it stays flat stable. Uh, that wraps up the treatments that are used in paper restoration. Let's go quickly through the, how the treatments are delivered. Um, there's four ways that we do it, um, and these are pretty much the standard ways you're going to see in any operation for paper restoration. You have a bath, um, you have spray delivery, you have vapor delivery. Vapor delivery is a more passive, uh, atmospheric kind of uh, delivery, and then manual again um, with your own uh, sweat and muscle there. Depending on what's appropriate for the pieces, the kinds of delivery treatment will do. Bath is always preferred. You can do a lot in a bath. I mentioned before, sometimes you can do a mold treatment and a cleaning treatment in a bath. Um, when you have a stable work that you can put in a bath, you can really accomplish a lot uh, with much less work. <coughs> with bath bath. Um, any appropriate size holding vessel can be used for a bath, uh, as long as the material it is isn't going to react with the chemical you're putting in it to cause a detrimental effect. Um, it needs to be larger than the substrate. You don't want your paper hanging over the edge of the cleaning tray. It can cause mechanical stress, creases, tears. Um, uh, we use film trays of various sizes. We've even made some. We've made some plexi ones that are enormous. And way back in the day, we even used one of those um, those big inflatable pools that did a good job on one of our things. Um, uh, what we have here in our studio, you see the white film trays. This one's in actually just a plain water rinsing bath. In the case where we're doing a cleaning in a bath, we actually layer uh, one layer of uh, material called Rime on the top and the bottom. It's a very fibrous, kind of paper-like substance, but it doesn't really tear easily. It's more like a very um, porous um, uh, textile. So that, we put that on each side just to make sure the integrity of the paper is maintained during the cleaning process. As far as adding the cleaning chemistry, once it's in this water, that's when we introduce the, uh, the actual chemicals to clean it. We don't make the chemical bath fill up the tray and then put the paper in there. We make sure the paper is in plain water, completely hydrated. No detrimental effect is occurring from just the plain water, and then we'll slowly introduce the other agents that are necessary for the treatment. Uh, another application is spray method. Um, a spray application is more appropriate and a pigment could be compromised if the work is submerged in a bath. Um, bleeding and or fading can occur uh, with inks and certain types of pigments. Um, this application is done on a vacuum table platen um, so that it's to hold the pigments in the paper. So um, 
basically applying, you can see in the picture here, this is a spray booth. Uh, at the bottom there is our plate, and that's actually a vacuum table. Um, so we're, we're applying the solutions uh, with a pump sprayer. In our case, you can use an electrical, mechanical sprayer. Um, there's still some aerosol products out there. They're, they're going away quickly, though. Um, so you're spraying it through the substrate. In, in a bath, you're going to have your paper sitting there, and you have that kind of weightless environment where it's lifting things out and off of the paper. Um, in the case of, like, say, a watercolor or a hand-colored print, you don't want that effect. It can just take that pigment right away, at least fading it, um, incorporating it into the actual solution so it can even dye the rest of the, the substrate. So this just pulls it straight through, and we can shoot localized areas. And in some cases, pigments are so fugitive, we actually mask them. We cut a mylar um, template, which is a thin, clear plastic. So we'll cut a template of the image, lay that on top, and just spray the plain paper areas and the stable areas around it. So it's a, it's a real good way to focus your cleaning, and it's much more safe uh, when you have fusion pigments involved. Vapor application is used for extremely uh, sensitive substrates and pigments, as well as um, odor uh, removal. Um, it's typically done for mold treatments and, and odor removal. There are some ways to do cleanings. Uh, we don't practice that in our studio, uh, but there are some vapor cleaning techniques out there as well. Uh, what you have here are several examples. This is a, just a box um, to deliver vapor. Typically, you're going to use some sort of chamber. You can either have a vapor chamber that's a box. It can be an entire sealed room, shed kind of a situation. It depends on what the purpose is and what you're doing with, uh, with your space. Um, in the case of a box, you typically want it to be um, clear on the wall so you can check out any progression um, uh, that's happening with the treatment. Down here, you see we, we went as, as remedial as just having a plastic bag that we sealed up. We put some works on paper that were involved in a fire and had a strong odor, so we're treating them with charcoal treatment in there, so we have it sealed, and those um, odors are being absorbed, and the molecules are being absorbed by the charcoal in these discs you see here. On the right, there's, a, there's no chamber involved here, but we're deodorizing that book um, with microchamber interleaving uh, paper sheets. It's a highly absorbent um, paper that's, that's literally absorbing the molecules that are causing the smell in the so these are all very passive ways of delivering a treatment, but um, they are effective, and especially so when any other kind of treatment is going to cause harm to, uh, to the liver. Um, using brushes, sponges, rollers, and other utensils um, to deliver the treatment is what we would consider a manual delivery. Um, it's typically done in conjunction um, with other applications. For instance, um, a spot cleaning, we just take a solution with a brush and you know, if we want to just clean up a couple of spots on a, on a watercolor because we can't clean the whole thing because of fugitive pigments, um, we can go about it in that way. Um, in some cases, even when we have an item in a bath and you have one section that you want to um, kind of treat a little more aggressively with more solution than another, you can take a brush, dip it in a real highly concentrated solution and, and apply it actually in the bath so you get a, a quick concentrated um, treatment to an area without actually leaving a lot of chemical in there because it'll quickly disperse into the, into the uh, rest of the solution. Surface cleaning is another way to, of applying. Uh, we're, not, we're not actually applying any chemistry or anything with the surface cleanings. Uh, with superficial dirt and residues, um, they're always removed for any treatment, even you can't always even see these things, but it's, it's standard practice to just make sure there's nothing superficial sitting on a substrate before we treat it. Um, talking about sponges and erasers, tack cloths and such, we have vulcanized sponges in here. This is uh, sacks that are filled with um, basically really dry eraser crumbs. Um, the material is a little porous, so you can shake out some eraser crumbs and slowly kind of roll them over a substrate and they can pick up particulates. These tack cloths are extremely dry but tacky and they, again, lifting things off. So the purpose is to lift things off the substrate. Again, you don't want to do any rubbing. The uh, vinyl eraser you have there notwithstanding, that one obviously is used for rubbing. Uh, but it's um, a very low abrasive eraser. It's obviously white, so it's not going to leave any color. Uh, and there are works on paper that are appropriate for a little bit of uh, rubbing eraser.
So that pretty much wraps up the science of how we do that. Um, I want to just touch briefly on prevention. Um, you don't always have, always have to worry about getting your works on paper restored if you take good care of them. Um, so the points I wanted to make here are archival framing materials. We're talking about non-acidic materials here, mats, backings, archival tapes and adhesives. Um, any of these will prolong uh, the life of a work on paper. Also storage. Storage in a dark, um, dry, and non-acidic environment is essential to the health of your work on paper. Um, temperature and humidity control are important. Um, using archival boxes or folders uh, are helpful as well in that regard. Uh, UV protective glass, if you're framing the item, is a must. Um, if you're going to invest in purchasing something that you want to put on your wall or, or collect or um, invest in having something restored and you want to put it in a frame a year later, if it's in the sunlight, you can, it can look completely different and compromised. So, Using that UV protective glass is a worthwhile investment. And finally, good housekeeping it makes a huge difference. Um, you know, you can have you can have a dirty environment that's susceptible to mold growth. Um, insects like dirtier places. Um, even um, just just dirt itself getting on the substrate is uh, detrimental. So you know, generally, good housekeeping is going to give you a, a better chance of not having to worry about getting your works on paper restored. Um, that concludes my presentation. Um, again, I'd like to thank Dr. Kolpas for uh, inviting me here and for the opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Justin will hang around for a while if you want to come up and talk with him. I have to leave in a couple of minutes, but please, if you did not sign this roster, I want to have a record of who attended the talk, so I will leave it here. And if you would just come up, and sign your name to the roster, that would be very helpful. One other item, a testimonial for Justin. Since 1969, I've been collecting antiquarian books, some of them as old as 500 years old, originals, and Justin has restored and repaired a number of them. Moreover, my wife's parents had an art gallery, and we could have never afforded, but we inherited acid and sun damage Picasso etchings, and Justin restored them as if they looked brand new. He performed miracles. My wife's reaction when she picked them up after they were faded and stained and there was some mold damage, she went, OMG. <laughs> they looked like they were brand new. He's a miracle worker, so. It's um, the town, not me. It's the town. <laughs> I run Anyhow, the business. I if, hire the town. It is, it is them. If me. you want to talk to Justin, please do so. But please come up here and sign in if you haven't already so I can leave and teach a class. Let's thank Justin. That was a wonderful <laughs>